Okay, everybody, we're being recorded. This is Scott from Solomon. Uh, we're going to start in just a minute at uh, 2 o'clock, and I'll, I'll be trying to watch the screen and admitting people as they arrive. I, I don't know how to um, to do the co-host feature, so my partner here, Ryan, is unable to help in that way. Um, I'm from Solomon. My partner and I, John Willems, started this company about seven, eight years ago, and it started with me um, asking John for help. He is a data processing pro. And, whoops. And he was wondering, you know, like seven, eight years ago, if there was any way that appraisers needed data help. And I said, do we ever? We, we've got this new um, requirement. I guess it's always been a requirement, but we need to support the adjustments that we make and other assignment results. So uh, he and I talked about ways to do that. We started down the road of um, uh, trying to do multiple regression, and we found some problems with that. And then John actually asked me one day, what's that book on your desk? And I said, well, that's my cost book, just to be thorough and to show that I'm uh, paying attention. I, I do the cost approach on every appraisal. And he, he thought, why don't we make cost a benchmark? So that's what we're going to do. And I, I just wanted to give you the background in USPAP. It says in standard one that we are um, to be aware of, understand, and correctly employ the recognized methods and techniques that are necessary to produce a credible appraisal. So uh, USPAP doesn't tell us what those recognized methods are. And by the way, this is the, the way the new USPAP looks. I recommend you buy your copy. Um, but that's the, the new motif. A lot of the words are the same. There's a few. Uh, they did a better job um, on the part about that has to do with bias so here's the book for the recognized methods this is part of the body of knowledge of the real estate profession and the recognized methods are paired data group data secondary data uh, statistical analysis including graphic and scenario analysis and then cost related adjustments including depreciated cost now the reason i like depreciated cost is because I can do it on every report, if, even if I don't have, um, you know, the best comparables. So to show how that works, let's go to the cost table. And remember now, this is unbiased third-party cost data. That's a, a, a good place to start. Um, this source is something that we license. So if you are a, a participant with Solomon, if you're a subscriber, this comes as part of your fee. So here we have a good standard house. And it's, um, you can see at 700 square feet. And by the way, the, the one through six uh, match up pretty well to the UAD system. So that's kind of a handy feature. Not all the cost sources do that. But at 700 feet, it's 183.59 per foot to build a house. And that is the average cost per foot. And we're gonna see in a minute why average cost is not the cost that we start with to make an adjustment. Um, and as you go up in quantity, the price per foot goes down, and that's because we're recapturing uh, the startup cost. Um, and I'm not sure exactly what the startup cost, but I'll show you what the total value is. It might just be the cost of doing business. Um, but here we are uh, at 2,200 feet. The cost goes down lower and lower still until we get down to 119.72. Now I'm going to flip over to this page. Whoop. What I've done here is I've arranged it so that the average cost of the small house is, um, you know, what I'm doing when I'm pausing, I'm admitting people, sorry. So 183.59 per foot times 700 feet is the total cost. So each of these will have a total cost. And because uh, Excel is such a wonderful tool, I can just type equal, meaning what do I want that cell to equal? I want it to equal cell c5 and then multiply it by d5 and press enter and it gives me the total cost and now the the beautiful thing with excel is you can fill all the way down and you'll get the total cost of each of these size houses now remember these are q4 so 5,000 feet is a total of six hundred thousand dollars and 700 feet is a total of 128 and we all saw before that the average cost 
was um, smaller for the biggest house and biggest for the smallest house, right? So um, this line that's that's made here, this is a uh, an Excel scatter chart that I've got filled in here. Uh, this line has an equation. The equation is, you know, why the value of that house of the GLA, not the land, just the GLA, is 109.51 times the number of square feet plus this uh, startup cost, 55.928. And uh, that's the total cost of any amount of GLA of Q4. Now, the slope of that line is the important number, the 109.51. That's the cost of one more square foot. That's called marginal cost in, financial, in the financial world. So I've, I've put it right down here. So at 110 marginal cost with zero effective age, the adjustment is $110 per foot rounded, right? And if we have um, a, an 18 year effective age, that means there's 30% depreciation. 18 divided by 60 is 0.3. So that's where that comes from. And then uh, the the rules of uh, economic age life depreciation say that economic life minus effective age is remaining economic life. And interestingly, this 42 years, if you divide that by 60, that means there's 70% contributory value. So the market is paying... $77 per foot, right? 70% of 110 for the house if it's a Q4. And this is base cost. The way that cost manuals work is they look at the base cost for the whole country. It's much more efficient to do that and then assign a multiplier for each local zip code and, and we'll help you handle that. So the beautiful thing about this is that we can apply this method to a unit cost like a bathroom. We can apply it to a, um, a square foot cost like GLA, basement size, basement finish. And we can also apply it to an assumed garage size, right? So uh, we can do a lot of adjustments this way. Looking at the grid, um, this is the, the bottom half of the grid. I used to just generalize and say you can do the whole bottom half of the grid with cost-related adjustments. Actually, you can do bathrooms, GLA, basement size, basement finish the garage adjustment, porch patio deck, things like functional utility and heating and cooling, I would say it'd be better not, you better not do those with uh, with cost data. But these are the adjustments that you can do with depreciated cost. And that leaves other adjustments above that point. So ab above that bathroom line, uh, things like bedrooms, site view design and so on we'll get into that um, in, in two weeks from now but those can be done with um, sensitivity analysis by looking at how they relate to the adjusted sale prices in other words we do the adjustments first that we can support with cost data and then we come back and, and do the others um, with uh, sensitivity now before we do those we would have to adjust for concessions and the date of sale the time adjustment but once you've done those two and the adjusted sale prices, or excuse me, and the uh, the cost related adjustments, you're in business. You can do pretty much the whole grid uh, with what we're gonna be talking about over the next three weeks. And here's my example. You've probably seen this before, but if uh, uh, people pay 450 for a house, um, nobody except an appraiser would stop and say, wait a minute, the land is 100,000. That means the contributory value of the house itself is 350. Um, and then nobody but a, but a very careful appraiser would say, wait a minute, I did the cost approach and I found out that that house replaced today would cost $500,000. So if we draw a line straight across, that means that cost exceeds the value and that amount is the depreciation. So here's uh, out of the 500,000, there's 150 depreciation and 350 is depreciated cost. That's the term used in our uh, appraisal form. So a depreciated cost in this context is the same as um, contributory value. So now I'm going to switch over to Solomon. Here is uh, our front page, uh, solomonappraisal.com. 
There's a way to subscribe. If you're so inclined, you can click that button, click order now, and then you will get to a page that says free demo, sign up. It's 14 days free. Uh, and there's other options there. But let's say we want to instead log in because we're already a member. So we log in, email and last name. So the first one I wanted to talk about today is our first calculator, Solomon Adjustment. If you enter the zip code, and, and to take the zip code multiplier out of the equation, I'm just going to type in the word base. You can always do that. That'll bypass the multiplier. Recall that in, in this analysis, we had just right out of the cost manual with no multiplier. So let's see, where am I here? All right. So let's say it's a Q4. The, uh, the zip code is base Q4 remaining economic life. Let's say that's 60 years, which means that there's no depreciation. And if we click this number, calculate, or this button, calculate, there's our GLA adjustment of $110. And that should look real familiar from that previous chart. That's the cost of one more foot of a Q4. If we went to a Q3, we'd have to change this to 70 because there's 70 years economic life in a Q3. And by the way, I use the, the numbers that are published in the cost manual. For Q1 through Q3, it's 70 years. For Q4 and Q5, it's 60. And for Q6, it's 55. So if it's a Q3 and the remaining life is 70, meaning that there's no depreciation, the cost of one more square foot of GLA is 153. So if there's only 35 years of remaining economic life, that means there's 50% depreciation. So these drop in half. So that's the mechanics of how Solomon adjustment works. Um, it's a good way to start in using Solomon. Um, there are some some questions about it. I used to get questions. How do I know effective age? How do I know remaining economic life? And the answer is that you really don't unless you do the cost approach. And the reason I say that, there are calculators out there that um, will tell you that they can calculate effective age. But the ones that I've seen, all they're calculating is uh, physical depreciation. They're not including external or functional, which are parts of effective age. So the second one I wanted to talk about was Sidekick. This is um, an expansion. Whoops, inter internet connection is unstable. I hope we're having good luck here. Um, the UAD quality is four again, let's say. And the multiplier is zero. We're not gonna have any uh, multiplier for the uh, the zip code area. Let's say that the economic life is 60. And if effective age is zero, that means it's new. There's no depreciation. So the contributory value is 100% of, uh, of the cost. Now, this feature over here has nothing to do with the calculations. It's just for bracketing. So let's say you've got a 2,350 square foot house that you want to appraise. And this would be helpful maybe for um, documenting in your work file the uh, comp search range plus or minus 20 percent and if you might you might need to expand that to plus or minus 25 percent if you're on lakeshore or there's limited sales probably uh, limited sales would be the more normal than not right now day in nowadays so that's sidekick now the other thing that sidekick does is it brings in um here's the gross living area the above grade full bath, um, the half bath, the basement size, basement finish, pretty much the same as before. Um, the basement full bath, basement half bath, for those of you up in northern climates like me where it's um, getting pretty cold nowadays. But up here, we have to have a footing that's at least 48 inches deep so that we don't get frost heave. So um, in most cases, people would rather have a full basement excavated and use that space for storage or finished area. So up here, we do love our basements. 
Uh, here's a fireplace, an additional fireplace. First garage, additional garage, first carport, additional carport. And then in this case, we're using 100 square feet of deck, porch, screen porch, and enclosed porch. <coughs> and you'll notice that we've, we've got a second column here. This means EQD, equal depreciation. If, if effective age was 18, going back to that 18 example again, now depreciation is 30%, contributory value is 70%, excellent uh, display to put in your work file. I like to use something called Snagit, where I can just take a screenshot. Um, the center column accounts for one of the issues with depreciated costs is that the house as a whole depreciates um, over 60 years, according to the cost manual. But some things last much longer, like a foundation. Some things um, dissipate pretty quickly, like a 20-year roof, a 20-year um, or maybe 30-year siding. I don't know, 30-year windows, 10-year paint, 10-year carpet. But a lot of the things that people react to in the condition area of an appraisal is due to uh, shorter effective age. So the way we account for that is we have this column called percent economic life. Um, I'll tell you this story in a, in a minute, but the best way to start is to think about a deck. According to the National Association of Home Builders, a deck has a 20-year life. And I know that differs because some decks are made out of composite material that might be lasting 50 years. Some decks are in the shade. Some are in, in the sun sunlight in Arizona. So um, in general... Um, 20 years is a good number for a deck's lifespan. So if you take 20 years for the deck and divide it by 60 years for the economic life of the uh, improvements as a whole, that's 33% of 60. That's what that means. So the deck adjustment for 100 square feet would be much smaller because it wears out faster. Um, that one is based on actual data. <clears throat> Excuse me. This one is based on my um, atmospheric extraction, as Tim Anderson would say. I'm, I'm saying here that the deck um, has exposure to the elements um, and it depreciates quickly um, for physical reasons. The covered porch um, has less exposure to the elements. The screen porch, even less than the enclosed porch, uh, is really not exposed. It's just unheated. But um, these others are related to like a basement finish. The basement finish is generally made out of short-lived items like ceiling tile, carpet, paint, things that go out of style. So I use 50%. That's just my rule of thumb. You might find it different in your market. Um, basement bathrooms, I think, are worth less because they're less functional than the above-grade bathrooms. People can generally put a basement bathroom in for less money than they could do it um, on the main floor. That's a very common expansion uh, in my market. People will add a second bathroom in the basement before they'll add a second bathroom up on the GLA section of the house. Same with fireplaces. The first fireplace after the depreciation might be $2,300. But after um, people are satisfied with that first fireplace, they might not need to have two to feel as warm and cozy so that second fireplace i say is worth about half in my market and that's an example of um, functional obsolescence uh, again part of effective age so functional obsolescence for that fireplace is just it's not uh, as desirable as the first fireplace so this is um an advance sidekick is an advance over our first tool but it really doesn't quite get us there because uh, we still haven't uh, provided any support for effective age. And again, if you're using a calculator that gives you the effective age, or if you're good at estimating effective age, more power to you. Um, I just am of the opinion that we should really do the cost approach. In fact, that's what I was telling people. Do the cost approach, and you'll find out the effective age. And then we spent some time and developed what I think is the... Um, the single, if you could only have one tool within Solomon, I think it would be this one. Excuse me. I'm uh, looking at our participants, and I've taken a sip of water from my, my dry throat here. 
But this tool will do the cost approach for you. Um, and while it's doing the cost approach, it will figure out the effective age. So let me show you what I mean. Um, you start with an estimate of market value. Now that's a lot of people wonder, how can you, are you doing circular reasoning here? Are you starting with an assumption and then trying to prove it? Well, I've, I've got a, a little uh, example here or a little tab called science. <clears throat> and this is my, my um, I borrowed this from a different website about the scientific method and I just changed the names a little bit. But in the scientific method, what we we do is we make observations um, after to solve a question that we have. So here's the value question. Here's the market observation step. And for me, that is a matter of, um, first of all, understanding the subject by looking at old, old MLSs or the current MLS or county records or, you know, looking at the um, aerial photographs and so on. So I'm making observations about the subject. I use those to develop a list of properties that I would consider that should be comparable enough to, to at least drive by and take a photo. I drive by those, take a photo. I go to the subject and measure. Um, I get back to my office and I look at internal, uh, interior photos of those comparables. And by that time, I think I've got enough information to form a hypothesis. Tim Anderson calls that a guess. But I'm going to guess the value. I'm going to form a hypothesis. I'm not appraising to that number because I'm going to follow the scientific method and test the hypothesis. And I'm going to test that in the grid using the adjustments that I've found um, in that in that Solomon app. Okay. I've got another person to admit here. All right. So that grid test. If the hypothesis is correct, in other words, if uh, if that $300,000 is pretty accurate, then I'll go ahead and finish the report. And if it's not, I'll change the hypothesis. So let's go back to, uh, to Solomon here. So here's my market value hypothesis. Um, I realize that it is a hypothesis. I think it's easier to estimate market value because there's so many clues. Easier to estimate market value than it is to use a sidekick where I'm estimating effective age, right? So you're gonna have to estimate one way or the other. I would prefer to estimate uh, market value because it's self-correcting when we get into that idea of checking the hypothesis. So I'm gonna make this one simple. Let's say we've got $80,000 of site value, 20,000 of site improvements. And by the way, we'll get at this in the future, but we've got a a series of uh, surveys right here that will show, will apply a percentage. And it says here that city sewer and water should be around 14.4. But let's say I'm I'm pretty sure that this one's above average in site improvements. So again, that's a little bit of an estimate. For the, I'm gonna type in the word base again because I want these to be the base numbers without adding anything for um, the multiplier. Quality rating is four. It's got 1,200 square feet. That sounds like a pretty small house, but in Minnesota, that's actually a pretty big house because it's got a finished basement. So here's the basement space and the basement finish. And then the basement full bath. Let's say there's one bath in the basement. And we ask for the bath count in the basement but not in the GLA. And the reason is that the basement numbers do not include bathroom costs. The GLA numbers do include the bathroom costs. So um, what else do we have here? We've got a 440 square foot garage. Now, if you'll see what's happening, um, this is the cost approach from here up. This chart or this table over here is the cost approach. The, the market's paying 300, we think. Um, the site value is 80, the site improvements are 20. So that means the market must be assigning $200,000 to the value of the house. So there's that $200,000, the contributory value of the building. It's the same as the depreciated cost. That's $200,000. Um, because we've been able to do the cost approach now with unbiased third-party cost data from uh, that we're licensing from National Building Cost. The dwelling is 162.78. That's a number that you can put in um, 
page three, the basement, 6279, and the garage, and you'll get a total of $296,000. $96,000 has to be the amount of depreciation, right? 296 minus 200 is 96. And then if we divide 96 by 296, that is 33% depreciation. And if 33% uh, depreciation is applied to the economic life of 60, there it is, the effective age is 20. So this does not have a place for you to enter effective age. It calculates effective age from site value and the costs, okay? So we've got a pretty solid support for assignment results like effective age with, with this method. Now we go down to the, to the lower part here and uh, the market is paying 67% of cost. Here's 67% again of the cost of one more foot, the cost of one more square foot of basement size. And here I would say 50% because basement finish um, depreciates faster than above grade mm. finish. Um, it doesn't benefit from the long life of the, uh, the you know, the uh, structure behind the basement finish. Uh, the full bath, I'm gonna say 50 right here. And the reason I do is because when I click calibrate, I've got an adjustment for the above grade bath and an adjustment for the below grade bath that I think is worth 50% of the up, up, above grade bath. Here's my deck. I'm going to say, oh, wait a minute, fireplace again. I'm going to say 50 because one of my comps might have two fireplaces and that second fireplace is worth 50% of the first one in my market. Um, this is all up to you right here. Uh, the deck, I'm going to say 33 and then 50. So what I'm doing here is saying a third, a half, two thirds and three quarters. So those are my calibrated adjustments. These are depreciated cost adjustments that are either, I don't know how you want to say this, but they're enhanced by understanding that not all components of the house depreciate equally. The house as a whole has a 60 year life, but some parts are less. Again, like the 20 year roof, uh, the 20 year or 10 year paint and carpet. So my next step would be to use these adjustments in the grid. And if that grid says, hey, 300 was a good hypothesis, those are my adjustments. I've got my cost approach done and I've got adjustments for the bottom half of the grid. So that is um, all the farther I wanted to get today with this. There's a couple more features here that we'll flesh out a little bit next time, next week. Like notice what happens if I change the site value to 50,000. That means there's the building is going to be worth a lot more and there'll be less depreciation, right? So you can do some what if analysis within this. Let's say that I want to include my zip code, minus 55123. That will bring in a factor of 10%. Okay, so now the effective age is lower. Um, but according to the cost manual, and, and I'll show you where to find that in a minute here, there's minus 9%. It costs 9% less to build a house in a subdivision where there's, um, you know, con or where they've got one group of contractors moving from one house to the next to multiple build savings. So now my, my um, effective age is even lower because I've got less cost. I know I should have said 80,000. Okay. So that's the essence of Solomon cost. The uh, user manual covers everything. It's um, You've got to have some patience to read through it. But again, here's that example. We're looking at a way to figure out what percentage of cost is being paid in the market. And then we're applying that percentage to the cost of components. And then we're keeping an eye on the idea that um, some components depreciate faster than others. So that's... What I had in mind for today, at this point, if people have questions, I would be happy to answer those.